Chapter Six of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I scrambled to the edge of the pit and played the light around inside. It shelled back at one side, and a dark mouth showed sloping down into the earth, the hiding place from which the globes had swarmed. Foster was wedged in the opening. I scrambled down beside him, tugged him back to the level ground. He was still breathing. That was something. I wondered if the pub owner would come back now that the lights were gone, or if he'd tell someone what had happened, bring out a search party. Somehow I doubted it. He didn't seem like the type to ask for trouble with the ghosts of ancient sinners. Foster groaned and opened his eyes. Where are they? he muttered. Take it easy, Foster, I said. You're okay now. Legion, Foster said. He tried to sit up. The Hunters! Okay, call them Hunters if you want to. I haven't got a better name for them. I worked them over with the flashlights. They're gone. That means... Let's not worry about what it means. Let's just get out of here. The Hunters! They burst out of the ground, from a cleft in the earth. That's right. You were halfway into the hole. I guess that's where they were hiding. The Pit of the Hunters, Foster said. If you say so, I said. Lucky you didn't go down it. Legion, give me the flashlight. I feel something coming on that I'm not going to like, I said. I handed him the light, and he flashed it into the tunnel mouth. I saw a polished roof of black glass arching four feet over the rubble-strewn bottom of the shaft. A stone, dislodged by my movement, clattered away down the thirty-degree slope. Hell, that tunnel's man-made, I said, peering into it and I don't mean Neolithic man. Legion, we'll have to see what's down there, Foster said. We could come back later with ropes and big insurance policies, I said. But we won't, Foster said. We found what we were looking for. Sure, I said, and it serves us right. Are you sure you feel good enough to make like Alice and the White Rabbit? I'm sure. Let's go. Foster thrust his legs into the opening, slid over the edge, and disappeared. I followed him. I eased down a few feet, glanced back for a last look at the night sky, then lost my grip and slid. I hit bottom hard enough to knock the wind out of me. I got to my hands and knees on a level, gravel-strewn floor. What is this place? I dug a flashlight out of the rubble, flashed it around. We were in a low-ceilinged room ten yards square. I saw smooth walls, the dark bulks of massive shapes that made me think of sarcophagi in Egyptian burial vaults, except that these threw back highlights from dials and levers. For a couple of guys who get shy in the company of cops, I said, we've a talent for doing the wrong thing. This is some kind of top-secret military installation. Impossible, Foster replied. This couldn't be a modern structure, at the bottom of a rubble-filled shaft. Let's get out of here fast, I said. We've probably set off an alarm already. As if in answer, a slow chime cut across our talk. Curly light sprang up on a square panel. I got to my feet, moved over to stare at it. Foster came to my side. What do you make of it? he said. I'm no expert on Stone Age relics, I said. But if that's not a radar screen, I'll eat it. I sat down in the single chair before the dusty control console and watched a red blip creep across the screen. Foster stood behind me. We owe a debt to that ancient sinner, he said. Who would have dreamed he'd lead us here? Ancient sinner, I said. This place is as modern as next year's jukebox. Look at the symbols on the machines, Foster said. They're identical with those in the first section of the journal. All pothooks look alike to me, I said. It's this screen that's got me worried. If I've got it doped out correctly, that blip is either a mighty slow airplane or it's at one hell of an altitude. Modern aircraft operate at great heights, Foster said. Not at this height, I said. Give me a few more minutes to study these scales. There are a number of controls here, Foster said. Obviously intended to activate mechanisms. Don't touch them, I said, unless you want to start World War III. I hardly think the results would be so drastic, Foster replied. 
Surely this installation has a simple purpose, unconnected with modern wars, but very possibly connected with the mystery of the journal and of my own past. The less we know about this, the better, I said. At least if we don't mess with anything, we can always claim we just stepped in here to get out of the rain. You're forgetting the hunters, said Foster. Some new anti-personnel gimmick. They came out of this shaft, Legion. It was opened by the pressure of the hunters bursting out. Why did they pick that precise moment, just as we arrived? I asked. I think they were aroused, said Foster. I think they sensed the presence of their ancient foe. I swung around to look at him. I see the way your thoughts are running, I said. You're their ancient foe now, huh? Just let me get this straight. That means that umpteen hundred years ago, you personally had a fight with the hunters here at Stonehenge. You killed a batch of them and ran. You hired some kind of Viking ship and crossed the Atlantic. Later on, you lost your memory and started being a guy named Foster. A few weeks ago, you lost it again. Is that the picture? More or less. And now we're a couple of hundred feet under Stonehenge, after a brush with a crowd of luminous stink bombs, and you're telling me you'll be nine hundred on your next birthday. Remember the entry in the journal, Legion? I came to the place of the hunters, and it was a place I knew of old, and there was no hive but a pit built by men of the two worlds. Okay, I said, so you're pushing a thousand. I glanced at the screen, got out a scrap of paper, and scribbled a rapid calculation. Here's another big number for you. That object on the screen is at an altitude, give or take a few percent, of 30,000 miles. I tossed the pencil aside, swung around to frown at Foster. What are we mixed up in, Foster? Not that I really want to know. I'm ready to go to a nice clean jail now and pay my debt to society. Calm down, Legion, Foster said. You're raving. Okay, I said, turning back to the screen. You're the boss. Do what you like. It's just my reflexes wanting to run. I've got no place to run to. At least with you, I've always got the wild hope that maybe you're not completely nuts, and that somehow... I sat upright, eyes on the screen. Look at this, Foster, I snapped. A pattern of dots flashed across the screen, faded, flashed again. Some kind of IFF, I said, a recognition signal. I wonder what we're supposed to do now. Foster watched the screen, saying nothing. I don't like that thing blinking at us, I said. It makes me feel conspicuous. I looked at the big red button beside the screen. Maybe if I pushed that. Without waiting to think it over, I jabbed at it. A yellow light blinked on the control panel. On the screen, the pattern of dots vanished. The red blip separated, a smaller blip moving off at right angles to the main mass. I'm not sure you should have done that, Foster said. There is room for doubt, I said in a strained voice. It looks like I've launched a bomb from the ship overhead. The climb back up the tunnel took three hours, and every foot of the way I was listening to a refrain in my head. This may be it. This may be it. This may be... I crawled out of the tunnel mouth and lay on my back, breathing hard. Foster groped his way out beside me. We'll have to get to the highway, I said, untying the ten-foot rope of ripped garments that had linked us during the climb. There's a telephone at the pub. We'll notify the authorities. I glanced up. Hold it. I grabbed Foster's arm and pointed overhead. What's that? Foster looked up. A brilliant point of blue light, brighter than a star, grew perceptibly as we watched. Maybe we won't get to notify anybody, after all, I said. I think that's our bomb, coming home to roost. That's illogical, Foster said. The installation would hardly be arranged merely to destroy itself in so complex a manner. Let's get out of here, I yelled. It's approaching us very rapidly, Foster said. The distance we could run in the next few minutes would be trivial by comparison with the killing radius of a modern bomb. We'll be safer sheltered in the cleft than on the open. We could slide down the tunnel, I said. And be buried? You're right. I'd rather fry on the surface. 
We crouched, watching the blue glare directly overhead growing larger, brighter. I could see Foster's face by its light now. That's no bomb, Foster said. It's not falling. It's coming down slowly, like a... Like a slowly falling bomb, I said. And it's coming right down on top of us. Goodbye, Foster. I can't claim it's been fun knowing you. But it's been different. We'll feel the heat at any second now. I hope it's fast. The glaring disk was the size of the full moon now, unbearably bright. It lit the plane like a pale blue sun. There was no sound. As it dropped lower, the disk foreshortened, and I could see a dark shape above it, dimly lit by the glare thrown back from the ground. The thing is the size of a ferry boat, I said. It's going to miss us, Foster said. It will come to ground several hundred feet to the east of us. We watched the slender shape float down with dreamlike slowness, now five hundred feet above, now three hundred, then hovering just above the giant stones. It's coming down smack on top of Stonehenge, I yelled. We watched as the vessel settled into place, dead center on the ancient ring of stones. For a moment they were vividly silhouetted against the flood of blue radiance. Then, abruptly, the glare faded and died. Foster, I said, do you think it's barely possible? A slit of yellow light appeared on the side of the hull. Then it widened to a square. A ladder extended itself, dropping down to touch the ground. If somebody with tentacles starts down that ladder, I said, in an unnaturally shrill voice, I'm getting out of here. No one will emerge, Foster said quietly. I think we'll find, Legion, that this ship of space is at our disposal. I'm not going aboard that thing, I said for the fifth time. I'm not sure of much in this world, but I'm sure of that. Legion, Foster said, this is no twentieth-century military vessel. It obviously homed on the transmitter in the underground station, which appears to be directly under the old monument, which is several thousand years old. And I'm supposed to believe the ship has been orbiting the Earth for the last few thousand years, waiting for someone to press the red button? You call that logical? Given permanent materials, such as those the notebook is made of, it's not impossible, or even difficult. We got out of the tunnel alive. Let's settle for that. We're on the verge of solving a mystery that goes back through the centuries, said Foster. A mystery that I've pursued, if I understand the journal, through many lifetimes. One thing about losing your memory, you don't have any fixed ideas to get in the way of your theories. Foster smiled grimly. The trail has brought us here. We must follow it wherever it leads. I lay on the ground, staring up at the unbelievable shape across the field, the beckoning square of light. This ship, or whatever it is, I said, it drops down out of nowhere and opens its doors, and you want to walk right into the cozy interior? Listen, Foster cut in. I heard a low rumbling then, a sound that rolled ominously, like distant guns. More ships, I started. Jet aircraft, Foster said. From the bases in East Anglia, probably. Of course, they'll have tracked our ship in. That's all for me, I yelled, getting to my feet. The secret's out. Get down, Legion, Foster shouted. The engines were a blanketing roar now. What for? They... Two long lines of fire traced themselves across the sky, curving down. I hit the dirt behind the stone in the same instant the rocket struck. The shock wave slammed at the earth like a monster thunderclap, and I saw the tunnel mouth collapse. I twisted, saw the red interior of the jet tailpipe as the fighter hurtled past, rolling into a climbing turn. They're crazy, I yelled, firing on. A second barrage blasted across my indignation. I hugged the muck and waited while nine salvos shook the earth. Then the rumble died reluctantly. The air reeked of high explosives. We'd have been dead now if we'd tried the tunnel, I gasped, spitting dirt. It caved at the first rocket. And if the ship was what you thought, Foster, they've destroyed something. The sentence died unnoticed. The dust was settling, and through it the shape of the ship reared up 
unchanged, except that the square of light was gone. As I watched, the door opened again, and the ladder ran out once more, invitingly. They'll try next time with nukes, I said. That may be too much for the ship's defenses, and it will sure be too much for us. Listen, Foster cut in. A deeper rumble was building in the distance. To the ship, Foster called. He was up and running, and I hesitated just long enough to think about trying for the highway and being caught in the open, and then I was running too. Ahead, Foster stumbled, crossing the ground that had been ripped up by the rocket bursts, made it to the ladder, and went up it fast. The growl of the approaching bombers grew, a snarl of deadly hatred. I leaped a still-smoking stone fragment, took the ladder in two jumps, plunged into the yellow-lit interior. Behind me, the door smacked shut. I was standing in a luxuriously fitted circular room. There was a pedestal in the center of the floor, from which a polished bar projected. The bones of a man lay beside it. While I stared, Foster sprang forward, seized the bar, and pulled. It slid back easily. The lights flickered, and I had a moment of vertigo. Nothing else happened. Try it the other way, I yelled. The bombs will fall any second. I went for it, hand outstretched. Foster thrust in front of me. Look! I stared at the glowing panel he was pointing to, a duplicate of the one in the underground chamber. It showed a curved white line with a red point ascending from it. We're clear, Foster said. We've made a successful takeoff. But we can't be moving. There's no acceleration. There must be soundproofing. That's why we can't hear the bombers. No soundproofing would help if we were at ground zero, Foster said. This ship is the product of an advanced science. We've left the bombers far behind. Where are we going? Who's steering this thing? It steers itself, I would judge, Foster said. I don't know where we're going, but we're well on the way. I looked at him in amazement. You like this, don't you, Foster? You're having the time of your life. I can't deny that I'm delighted at this turn of events, Foster said. Don't you see? This vessel is a launch, or lifeboat, under automatic control, and it's taking us to the mother ship. Okay, Foster, I said. I looked at the skeleton on the floor behind him. But I hope we have better luck than the last passenger. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of A Trace of Memory》by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was two hours later, and Foster and I stood silent before a ten-foot screen that had glowed into life when I touched a silver button beside it. It showed us a vast emptiness of bottomless black, set thick with coruscating points of polychrome brilliance that hurt to look at, and against that backdrop a ship, vast beyond imagining blotting out half the titanic vista with its bulk, but dead. Even from the distance of miles I could sense it. The great black torpedo shape, dull moonlight glinting along the unbelievable length of its sleek flank, drifted, a derelict. I wondered for how many centuries it had waited here, and for what. I feel, said Foster, somehow I'm coming home. I tried to say something, croaked cleared my throat. If, the <coughs> if this is your jitney, I said, I hope they didn't leave the meter ticking on you. We're broke. We're closing rapidly, said Foster. Another ten minutes, I'd guess. How do we go about heaving to alongside? You didn't come across a book of instructions, did you? I think I can predict that the approach will be automatic. This is your big moment, isn't it? I said. I've got to hand it to you, pal. You've won out by pluck, just like the rover boys. The ship appeared to move smoothly closer, looming over us, fine golden lines of decorative filigree work visible now against the black. A tiny square of pale light appeared, grew into a huge bay door that swallowed us. The screen went dark, there was a gentle jar, then motionlessness. The port opened silently. We've arrived, Foster said. Shall we step out and have a look? I wouldn't think of going back without one, I said. 
I followed him out and stopped dead, gaping. I had expected an empty hold, bare metal walls. Instead, I found a vaulted cavern, shadowed, mysterious, rich with a thousand colors. There was a hint of strange perfume in the air, and I heard low music that muttered along stalagmite-like buttresses. There were pools, playing fountains, waterfalls, dim vistas stretching away, lit by slanting rays of muted sunlight. What kind of place is it? I asked. It's like a fairyland, or a dream. It's not an earthly scheme of decoration, Foster said, but I find it strangely pleasing. Hey, look over there, I yelped suddenly, pointing. An empty-eyed skull stared past me from the shadows at the base of a column. Foster went over to the skull, stood looking down at it. There was a disaster here, he said. That much is plain. It's creepy, I said. Let's go back. I forgot to get film for my brownie. The long dead pose no threat, said Foster. He was kneeling, looking at the white bones. He picked up something, stared at it. Look, Legion. I went over. Foster held up a ring. We're on to something hot, pal, I said. It's the twin to yours. I wonder who he was. I shook my head. If we knew that, and who killed him, or what... Let's go on. The answers must be here somewhere. Foster moved off toward a corridor that reminded me of a sunny avenue lined with chestnut trees, though there were no trees and no sun. I followed, gaping. For hours we wandered, looking, touching, not saying much, but saturated in wonder, like kids in a toy factory. We came across another skeleton lying among towering engines. Finally, we paused in a giant storeroom stacked high with supplies. Have you stopped to think, Foster? I said, fingering a length of rose-violet cloth as thin as woven spiderwebs. This boat's a treasure house of saleable items. Talk about the wealth of the Indies. I seek only one thing here, my friend, Foster said. My past. Sure, I said, but just in case you don't find it, you might consider the business angle. We can set up a regular shuttle run, hauling stuff down. You Earthmen, sighed Foster, for you every new experience is immediately assessed in terms of its merchandising possibilities. Well, I leave that to you. Okay, okay, I said. You go on ahead and scout around down that way if you want, where the technical-looking stuff is. I want to browse around here for a while. As you wish. We'll meet at this end of the big hall we passed back there, okay? Foster nodded and went on. I turned to a bin filled with what looked like unset emeralds the size of walnuts. I picked up a handful, juggled them lovingly. Anyone for marbles? I murmured to myself. Hours later, I came along a corridor that was like a path through a garden that was a forest, crossed a ballroom like a meadow, floored in fine-grained rust-red wood and shaded by giant ferns, and went under an arch into the hall where Foster sat at a long table cut from yellow marble. A light the color of sunrise gleamed through tall, pseudo-windows. I dumped an armful of books on the table. Look at these, I said, all made from the same stuff as the journal. And the pictures! I flipped open one of the books, a heavy folio-sized volume, to a double-page spread in color showing a group of bearded Arabs in dingy white jalabas staring toward the camera, a flock of thin goats in the background. It looked like the kind of picture the National Geographic runs, except that the quality of the color and detail was equal to the best color transparencies. I can't read the print, I said, but I'm a whiz at looking at pictures. Most of the books showed scenes like I hope I never see in the flesh but I found a few that were made on earth. God knows how long ago. Travel books, perhaps, Foster said. Travel books that you could sell to any university on earth for their next year's budget, I said, shuffling pages. Take a look at this one. Foster looked across at the panoramic shot of a procession of shaven-headed men in white sarongs carrying a miniature golden boat on their shoulders. 
descending a long flight of white stone steps leading from a colonnade of heroic human figures with folded arms and painted faces. In the background, brick-red cliffs loomed up, baked in desert heat. That's the temple of Hat Shepset in its prime, I said, which makes this print close to four thousand years old. Here's another I recognize. I turned to a smaller aerial view, showing a gigantic pyramid, its polished stone facing chipped in places and with a few panels missing from the lower levels, revealing the cruder structure of massive blocks beneath. That's one of the major pyramids, maybe Khufu's, I said. It was already a couple thousand years old and falling into disrepair. And look at this. I opened another volume showed Foster a vivid photograph of a great shaggy elephant with a pinkish trunk upraised between wide-curving yellow tusks. A mastodon, I said, and there's a woolly rhino, and an ugly-looking critter that must be a saber-tooth. This book is old. A lifetime of rummaging wouldn't exhaust the treasures aboard this ship, said Foster. How about bones? Did you find any more? Foster nodded. There was a disaster of some sort, perhaps disease. None of the bones was broken. I can't figure the one in the lifeboat, I said. Why was he wearing a necklace of bear's teeth? I sat down across from Foster. We've got plenty of mysteries to solve, all right. But there are some other items we'd better talk about. For instance, where's the kitchen? I'm getting hungry. Foster handed me a black rod from among several that lay on the table. I think this may be important, he said. What is it, a chopstick? Touch it to your head, above the ear. What does it do, give you a massage? I pressed it to my temple. I was in a gray-walled room, facing a towering surface of ribbed metal. I reached out, placed my hands over the proper perforations. The housings opened. For apparent malfunction in the quaternary field amplifiers, I knew, auto-inspection circuit override was necessary before activation. I blinked, looked around at the yellow table and piled books, the rod in my hand. I was in some kind of powerhouse, I said. There was something wrong with, with... The quaternary field amplifiers, Foster said. I seemed to be right there, I said. I understood exactly what it was all about. These are technical manuals, Foster said. They'll tell us everything we need to know about the ship. I was thinking about what I was getting ready to do, I said, the way you do when you're starting into a job. I was troubleshooting the quaternary watsits, and I knew how. Foster got to his feet and moved toward the doorway. We'll have to start at one end of the library and work our way through, he said. It will take us a while, but we'll get the facts we need. Then we can plan. Foster picked a handful of briefing rods from the racks in the comfortably furnished library and started in. The first thing we needed was a clue as to where to look for food and beds, or for operating instructions for the ship itself. I hoped we might find the equivalent of a library card catalog. Then we could put our hands on what we wanted in a hurry. I went to the far end of the first rack and spotted a short row of red rods that stood out vividly among the black ones. I took one out, thought it over, decided it was unlikely that it was any more dangerous than the others, and put it against my temple. As the bells rang, I applied neurovascular tension, suppressed cortical areas upsilon zeta and iota, and stood by for... I jerked the rod from my head, my ears still ringing with the shrill alarm. The effect of the rods was like reality itself, but intensified. All attention focused single-mindedly on the experience at hand. I thought of the entertainment potentialities of the idea. You could kill a tiger, ride an airplane down in flames, face the heavyweight champion. I wondered about the stronger sensations, like pain and fear. Would they seem as real as the impulse to check the watchmacallits, or tighten up your cortical thingamajigs? I tried another rod. At the sound of the apex tone, I racked instruments, walked, not ran, to the nearest transfer channel. Another. Having assumed duty as alert officer, I reported first to coordination control via short line, and confirmed rapport. 
These were routine SOPs covering simple solutions aboard ship. I skipped a few, tried again. Needing a Zyvermeter, I keyed Instruction Complex 1, followed with the code. Three rods further along, I got this. The situation falling outside my area of primary conditioning, I reported in corpo to Technical Building, Level 9, Section 4, Subsection 12, Preliminary. I recalled that it was now necessary to supply my activity code. My activity code. My activity code. A sensation of disorientation grew. Confused images flickered like vague background noise. Then a clear voice cut across the confusion. You have suffered partial personality fade. Do not be alarmed. Select a general background orientation rod from the nearest emergency rack. Its location is... I was moving along the stacks to pause in front of a niche where a U-shaped plastic strip was clamped to the wall. I removed it, fitted it to my head. Then, I was moving along the stacks to pause in front of a niche. I was leaning against the wall, my head humming. The red stick lay on the floor at my feet. That last bit had been potent. Something about a general background briefing. Hey, Foster, I called. I think I've got something. He appeared from the stacks. As I see it, I said, this background briefing should tell us all we need to know about the ship. Then we can plan our next move more intelligently. We'll know what we're doing. I took the thing from the wall, just as I had seemed to do in the phantom scene the red rod had projected for me. These things make me dizzy, I said, handing it to Foster. Anyway, you're the logical one to try it. He took the plastic shape, went to the reclining seat at the near end of the library hall, and settled himself. I have an idea this one will hit harder than the others, he said. He fitted the clamp to his head, and instantly his eyes glazed. He slumped back, limp. Foster! I yelled. I jumped forward, started to pull the plastic piece from his head, then hesitated. Maybe Foster's abrupt reaction was standard procedure but I didn't like it much. I went on reasoning with myself. After all, this was what the Red Rod had indicated as normal procedure in a given emergency. Foster was merely having his faded personality touched up, and his full-blown, three-dimensional personality was what we needed to give us the answers to a lot of the questions we'd been asking. Though the ship and everything in it had lain unused and silent for forgotten millennia, still, the library should be good, the librarian was gone from his post for forgotten centuries, and Foster was lying unconscious, and I was thirty thousand miles from home, but I shouldn't let trifles like that worry me. I got up and prowled the room. There wasn't much to look at except stacks, and more stacks. The knowledge stored here was fantastic, both in magnitude and character. If I ever get home with a load of these rods... I strolled through a door leading to another room. It was small, functional, dimly lit. The middle of the room was occupied by a large and elaborate divan with a capped-shaped fitting at one end. Other curious accoutrements were ranked along the walls. There wasn't much in them to thrill me, but bone-wise I had hit the jackpot. Two skeletons lay near the door in the final slump of death. Another lay beside the fancy couch. There was a long-bladed dagger beside it. I squatted beside the two, near the door, and examined them closely. As far as I could tell, they were as human as I was. I wondered what kind of men they had been, what kind of world they had come from, that could build a ship like this and stock it as it was stocked. The dagger that lay near the other bones was interesting. It seemed to be made of a transparent orange metal, and its hilt was stamped in a repeated pattern of the two worlds motif. It was the first clue as to what had taken place among these men when they last lived. Not a complete clue, but a start. I took a closer look at an apparatus like a dentist chair parked against a wall. There were spidery-looking metal arms mounted above it, and a series of colored glass lenses. A row of dull silver cylinders was racked against the wall. Another projected from a socket at the side of the machine. I took it out and looked at it. 
It was a plain, pewter-colored plastic, heavy and smooth. I felt pretty sure it was a close cousin to the chopsticks stored in the library. I wondered what brand of information was recorded in it as I dropped it in my pocket. I lit a cigarette and went out to where Foster lay. He was still in the same position as when I had left him. I sat down on the floor beside the couch to wait. It was an hour before he stirred. He heaved a sigh and opened his eyes. He reached up, pulled off the plastic headpiece, dropped it on the floor. Are you okay? I said. Brother, I've been sweating. Foster looked at me, his eyes traveling up to my uncombed hair and down to my scuffed shoes. His eyes narrowed in a faint frown. Then he said something in a language that seemed to be all Z's and Q's. Don't spring any surprises on me, Foster, I said hoarsely. Talk American. A look of surprise crossed his face. He stared into my eyes again, then glanced around the room. This is a ship's library, he said. I heaved a sigh of relief. Phew, you gave me a scare, Foster. I thought for a second your memory was wandering again. Foster was watching my face as I spoke. What was it all about? I said. What have you found out? I know you, said Foster slowly. Your name is Legion. I nodded. I can feel myself getting tense again. Sure, you know me. Just take it easy, pal. This is no time to lose your marbles. I put a hand on his shoulder. You remember, we were... He shook my hand off. That is not the custom in Valen, he said coldly. Valen, I echoed. What kind of routine is this, Foster? We were friends when we walked into this room an hour ago. We were hot on the trail of something, and I'm human enough to want to know how it turned out. Where are the others? There's a couple of others in the next room, I snapped, but they've lost a lot of weight. I can find you several more in the same condition. Outside of them, there's only me. Foster looked at me as if I wasn't there. I remember Valen, he said. He put a hand to his head. But I remember, too, a barbaric world, brutal and primitive. You were there. We traveled in a crude rail car, and then in a barge that wallowed in the sea. There were narrow, ugly rooms, evil odors, harsh noises. That's not a very flattering portrait of God's country, I said, but I'm afraid I recognize it. The people were the worst, Foster said, misshapen, diseased, with swollen abdomens and wasted skin and withered limbs. Some of the boys don't get out enough, I said. The hunters, we fled from them, Legion, you and I, and I remember a landing ring. He paused. Strange, it had lost its capstones and fallen into ruin. Us natives call it Stonehenge. The hunters burst out of the earth. We fought them. But why should the hunters seek me? I was hoping you'd tell me, I said. Do you know where this ship came from and why? This is a ship of the two worlds, he replied. But I know nothing of how it came to be here. How about all that stuff in the journal? Maybe now you... A journal, Foster broke in. Where is it? In your coat pocket, I guess. Foster felt through his jacket awkwardly, brought out the journal. He opened it. I moved around to look over his shoulder. He had the book open to the first section, the part written in the curious alien characters that nobody had been able to decipher. And he was reading it. We sat at the library table of deep green, heavy, polished wood the journal open at its center. For hours I had waited while Foster read. Now at last he leaned back in his chair, ran a hand through his youthful black hair, and sighed. My name, he said, was Qualquin, and this, he laid his hands upon the book, is my story. This is one part of the past I was seeking, and I remember none of it. Tell me what the journal says, I asked. Read it to me. Foster picked it up, riffled the pages. It seems that I awoke once before, in a small room aboard this vessel. I was lying on a memo couch, by which circumstance I knew that I had suffered a change. You mean you'd lost your memory. And regained it on the couch. 
My memory trace had been re-impressed upon my mind. I awoke knowing my identity, but not how I came to be aboard this vessel. The journal says that my last memory was of a building beside the shallow sea. Where's that? On a far world called Valen. Yeah? And what next? I looked around me and saw four men lying on the floor, slashed and bloody. One was alive. I gave him what emergency treatment I could, then searched the ship. I found three more men, dead, none living. Then the hunters attacked, swarming to me. Our friends, the fireballs, yes. They would have sucked the life from me, and I had no shield of light. I fled to the lifeboat carrying the wounded man. I descended to the planet below, your Earth. The man died there. He had been my friend, a man named Amerlin. I buried him in a shallow depression in the earth and marked the place with a stone. The ancient sinner, I said. Yes. I suppose it was his bones the lay brother found. And we found out last night that the depression was the result of dirt sifting into the ventilator shaft. But I guess you didn't know anything about the underground installation way back then. Doesn't the journal say anything? No. There is no mention made of it here. Foster shook his head. How curious to read of the affairs of this stranger and know he is myself. How about the hunters? How did they get to Earth? They are insubstantial creatures, said Foster. Yet they can endure the vacuum of space. I can only surmise that they followed the lifeboat down. They were tailing you? Yes, but I have no idea why they pursued me. They're harmless creatures in the natural state used to seek out the rare fugitive from justice on Valon. They can be attuned to the individual. Thereafter, they follow him and mark him out for capture. Kind of like bloodhounds, I said. Say, what were you, a big-time racketeer on Valon? The journal is frustratingly silent as to my Valonian career, said Foster. But this whole matter of the unexplained intergalactic voyage and the evidences of violence aboard the ship make me wonder whether I and perhaps others of my companions were being exiled for crimes done in the two worlds. Wow! So they sicked the hunters on you, I said. But why did they hang around at Stonehenge all this time? There was a trickle of power feeding the screens, said Foster. They need a source of electrical energy to live. Until a hundred years ago, it was the only one on the planet. How did they get down into the shaft without opening it up? Given time, they pass easily through porous substances. But of course, last night when I came on them after their alarm fast, they simply burst through in their haste. Okay, what happened next, after you buried the man? The journal tells that I was set upon by natives, men who wore the hides of animals. One of their number entered the ship. He must have moved the drive lever. It lifted, leaving me marooned. So those were his bones we found in the boat, I mused. The ones with the bear-tooth necklace. I wonder why he didn't come into the ship. Undoubtedly he did. But remember the skeleton we found just inside the landing port? That must have been a pretty fresh and rather gory corpse at the time the savage stepped aboard. It probably seemed to him all too clear an indication of what lay in store for himself if he ventured further. In his terror, he must have retreated to the boat to wait, and there starved to death. He was stranded in your world, and you were stranded in his. Yes, said Foster. And then, it seems, I lived among the brute men and came to be their king. I waited there by the landing ring through many years in the hope of rescue. Because I did not age as the natives did, I was worshipped as a god. I would have built a signaling device, but there were no pure metals, nothing I could use. I tried to teach them, but it was a work of centuries. I should think you could have set up a school, trained the smartest ones, I said. There was no lack of intelligent minds, Foster said. It is plain that the savages were of the blood of the two worlds. This earth must have been seeded long ago by some ancient castaways. But how could you go on living for hundreds of years? Are your people supermen that live forever? The natural span of a human life is very great. Among your people, there is a wasting disease, from which you all die young. That's no disease, I said. You just naturally get old and die. 
The human mind is a magnificent instrument, Foster said, not meant to wither quickly. I'll have to chew that one over, I said. Why didn't you catch this disease? All Valonians are inoculated against it. I'd like a shot of that, I said. But let's get back to you. Foster turned the pages of the journal. I ruled many peoples, under many names, he said. I traveled in many lands, seeking for skilled metal workers, glass blowers, wise men. But always I returned to the landing ring. It must have been tough, I said, exiled on a strange world, living out your life in a wilderness, century after century. My life was not without interest, Foster said. I watched my savage people put aside their animal hides and learn the ways of civilization. I taught them how to build and keep herds and till the land. I built a great city, and I tried, foolishly, to teach their noble caste the code of chivalry of the two worlds. But although they sat at a round table like the great ring board at Ak Hamalaf, they never really understood. And then they grew too wise, and wondered at their king who never aged. I left them and tried again to build a long signaller. The hunters sensed it and swarmed to me. I drove them off with fires, and then I grew curious and followed them back to their nest. I know, I said, and it was a place you knew of old. No hive, but a pit built by men. They overwhelmed me. I barely escaped with my life. Starvation had made the hunters vicious. They would have drained my body of its life energy. And if you'd known the transmitter was there, but you didn't, so you put an ocean between you and them. They found me, even there. Each time I destroyed many of them and fled, but always a few lived to breed and seek me out again. But your signaler, didn't it work? No, it was a hopeless attempt. Only a highly developed technology could supply the raw materials. I could only teach what I knew, encourage the development of the sciences, and wait. And then I began to forget. Why? A mind grows weary, Foster said. It is the price of longevity. It must renew itself. Shock and privation hasten the change. I had held it off for many centuries. Now I felt it coming on me. At home, on Valen, a man would record his memory at such a time, store it electronically in a recording device, and after the change, use the memory trace to restore, in his renewed body, his old recollections in toto. But, marooned as I was, my memories, once lost, were gone forever. I did what I could. I prepared a safe place and wrote messages that I would find when I awoke. When you woke up in the hotel, you were young again, overnight. How could it happen? When the mind renews itself, easing the scars of the years, the body too regenerates. The skin forgets its wrinkles and the muscles their fatigue. They become again as they once were. When I first met you, I said, you told me about waking up back in 1918 with no memory. Yours is a harsh world, Legion. I must have forgotten many times. Somewhere, sometime, I lost the vital link, forgot my quest. When the hunters came again, I fled, not understanding. You had a machine gun set up in the house at Mayport. What good was that against the hunters? None, I suppose, Foster replied. But I didn't know. I only knew that I was pursued. And by then, you could have made a signaler, I said. But you'd forgotten how, or even that you needed one. But in the end, I found it, with your help, Legion. But still there is a mystery. What came to pass aboard this ship all those centuries ago? Why was I here? And what killed the others? Look, I said, here's a theory. There was a mutiny while you were in the machine having your memory fixed. You woke up, and it was all over, and the crew was dead. That hypothesis will serve, said Foster. But one day I must learn the truth of this matter. What I can't figure out is why somebody from Valen didn't come after this ship. It was right here in orbit. Consider the immensity of space, Legion. This is one tiny world among the stars. But there was a station here, fitted out for handling your ships. 
That sounds like it was a regular port of call. And the books with the pictures. They prove your people have been here off and on for thousands of years. Why would they stop coming? There are such beacons on a thousand worlds, said Foster. Think of it as a buoy marking a reef, a trailblaze in a wilderness. Ages could pass before a wanderer chanced to sway again. The fact that the ventilator shaft at Stonehenge was choked with the debris of centuries when I first landed there shows how seldom this world was visited. I thought about it. Bit by bit, Foster was putting together the jigsaw pieces of his past. But he still had a long way to go before he had the big picture, frame and all. I had an idea. Say, you said you were in a memory machine. You woke up there, and you just had your memory restored. Why not do the same thing again, now? That is, if your brain can take another pounding this soon. Yes, he said. He stood up abruptly. There's just a chance. Come. I followed him out of the library into the room with the bones. He moved over to look down at them curiously. Quite a fracas, I said. Three of them. This would be the room where I awakened, said Foster. Those are the men I saw dead. They're still dead, I said. But what about the machine? Foster walked across to the fancy couch, leaned down beside it, then shook his head. No, he said. Of course, it wouldn't be here. What? My memory trace, the one that was used to restore my memory that other time. Suddenly I recalled the cylinder I had pocketed hours before. With a surprising flutter at my heart, I held it up like a kid in a classroom who knows he's got the right answer. This it? Foster glanced at it briefly. No, that's an empty. Like those you see filed over there. He pointed to the rack of pewter-colored cylinders on the opposite wall. They would be used for emergency recordings. Regular multi-life memory traces would be key-coded with a pattern of colored lines. It figures, I said. That would have been too easy. We have to do everything the hard way. I looked around. It's a big bureau to look for a collar button under. But I guess we can try. It doesn't matter, really. When I return to Valon, I'll recover my past. There are vaults where every citizen's trace is stored. But you had yours here with you. It could only have been a copy. The master trace is never removed from Akamaloth. I guess you'll be eager to get back there, I said. That would be quite a moment for you, getting back home after all these years. Speaking of years, were you able to figure out how long you were marooned down on Earth? I lost all record of dates long ago, said Foster. I can only estimate the time. About how long, I persisted. Since I descended from this ship, Legion, he said, three thousand years have passed. I hate to see the team split up, I said. You know, I was kind of getting used to being an apprentice nut. I'm going to miss you, Foster. Come with me to Valen, Legion, he said. We were standing in the observation lounge, looking out at the bright-lit surface of the earth thirty thousand miles away. Beyond it, the dead white disk of the moon hung like a cardboard cutout. Thanks anyway, buddy, I said. I'd like to see those other worlds of yours, but in the end I might regret it. It's no good giving an Eskimo a television set. I'd just sit around on Valen pining for home, beat up people, stinks, and all. You could return here some day. From what I understand about traveling in a ship like this, I said, a couple of hundred years would pass before I got back, even if it only seemed like a few weeks en route. I want to live out my life here with the kind of people I know, in the world I grew up in. It has its faults, but it's home. Then there is nothing I can do, Legion, Foster said, to reward your loyalty and express my gratitude. Well, ah, uh, I said, there is a little something. Let me take the lifeboat and stock it with a few goodies from the library and some of those marbles from the storeroom and a couple of the smaller mechanical gadgets. I think I know how to merchandise them in a way that'll leave the economy on an even keel, and incidentally set me up for life. As you said, I'm a materialist. As you wish, Foster said. Take whatever you desire. One thing I'll have to do when I get back, I said, 
is open the tunnel at Stonehenge enough to sneak a thermite bomb down it, if they haven't already found the beacon station. As I judge the temper of the local people, Foster said, the secret is safe for at least three generations. I'll bring the boat down in a blind spot where radar won't pick it up, I said. Our timing was good. In another few years, it wouldn't have been possible. And this ship would soon have been discovered, Foster said, in spite of radar negative screens. I looked at the great smooth sphere hanging, haloed, against utter black. The Pacific Ocean threw back a brilliant image of the sun. I think I see an island down there that will fit the bill perfectly, I said. And if it doesn't, there are a million more to choose from. You've changed, Legion, Foster said. You sound like a man with a fair share of joie de vivre. I used to think I was a guy who never got the breaks, I said. There's something about standing here looking at the world that makes that kind of thinking sound pretty dumb. There's everything down there a man needs to make his own breaks, even without a stock of trade goods. Every world has its rules of life, Foster said, some more complex than others. To face your own reality, that's the challenge. Me against the universe, I said. With those odds, even a loser can look good. I turned to Foster. We're in a ten-hour orbit, I said. We'd better get moving. I want to put the boat down in southern South America. I know a place there where I can offload without answering too many questions. You have several hours before the most favorable launch time, Foster said. There's no hurry. Maybe not, I said, but I've got a lot to do. I took a last look toward the majestic planet beyond the view screen, and I'm eager to get started. End of chapter 7《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
Within a week after the pictures hit the neighborhood theaters around Bayonne, New Jersey, in a cautious tryout, I had offers up to half a million for my next consignment. No questions asked. I left my pal Mickey to handle the details on a percentage basis and headed back for Idzenka. The lifeboat was just as I'd left it. It would have been all right for another fifty years, as far as the danger of anybody stumbling over it was concerned. I explained to the crew I brought out with me that it was a fake rocket ship, a prop I was using for a film I was making. I let them wander all over it and get their curiosity out of their systems. The consensus was that it wouldn't fool anybody. No tail fins, no ray guns, and the instrument panel was a joke. But they figured that it was my money, so they went to work setting up a system of camouflage nets, part of the plot, I told them and offloading my cargo. A year after my homecoming, I had my island, a square mile of perfect climate, fifteen miles off the Peruvian coast, and a house that was tailored to my every whim by a mind-reading architect who made a fortune on the job and earned it. The uppermost floor, almost a tower, was a strong room, and it was there that I had stored my stock in trade. I had sold off the best of the hundred or so films I had picked out before leaving Foster, but there were plenty of other items. The projector itself was the big prize. The self-contained power unit converted nuclear energy to light with a 99% efficiency. It scanned the films, one molecular layer at a time, and projected a continuous picture. No sixteen frames a second flicker here. The color and sound were absolutely lifelike with the result that I had had a few complaints from my distributor that the Technicolor was kind of washed out. The principles involved in a projector were new, and in theory at least, way over the heads of our local physicists. But the practical application was nothing much. I figured that with the right contacts in scientific circles to help me introduce the system, I had a billion-dollar industry up my sleeve. I had already fed a few little gimmicks into the market a tough paper suitable for shirts and underwear, a chemical that bleached teeth white as the driven snow, an all-color pigment for artists. With the knowledge I had absorbed from all the briefing rods I had studied, I had the techniques of a hundred new industries at my fingertips, and I hadn't exhausted the possibilities yet. I spent most of a year roaming the world, discovering all the things that a free hand with a dollar bill could do for a man. The next year I put in fixing up the island, buying paintings and rugs and silver for the house, and a concert grand piano. After the first big thrill of economic freedom had worn off, I still enjoyed my music. For six months I had a full-time physical instructor giving me a twenty-four-hour-a-day routine of diet, sleep, and all the precision bodybuilding my metabolism could stand. At the end of the course I was twice the man I'd ever been, the instructor was a physical wreck, and I was looking around for a new hobby. Now, after three years, it was beginning to get me. Boredom. The disease of the idle rich, that I had sworn would never touch me. But thinking about wealth and having it on your hands are two different things, and I was beginning to remember almost with nostalgia the tough old times when every day was an adventure full of cops and missed meals and a thousand unappeased desires. Not that I was really suffering. I was relaxed in a comfortable chair, after a day of surf fishing and a modest dinner of Chateaubriand. I was smoking a skinny cigar rolled by an expert from the world's finest leaf and listening to the best music a thousand-dollar hi-fi could produce. And the view, though free, was worth a million dollars a minute. After a while, I would stroll down to the boathouse, start up the Rolls-powered launch, and tool over to the mainland, transfer to my caddy convertible, and drive into town, where a tall brunette from Stockholm was waiting for me to take her to the movies. My steady gal was a hard-working secretary for an electronics firm. I finished up my stogie and leaned forward to drop it in a big silver ashtray when something caught my eye out across the red-painted water. I sat squinting at it, then went inside and came out with a pair of seven-by-fifty binoculars. I focused them and studied the dark speck that stood out clearly now against the gaudy sky. 
It was a heavy-looking powerboat heading dead toward my island. I watched it come closer, swing off toward a hundred-foot concrete jetty I had built below the seawall, and ease alongside in a murmur of powerful engines. They died, and the boat sat in a sudden silence, dwarfing the pier. I studied the bluish-gray hull, the inconspicuous flag aft. Two heavy deck guns were mounted on the foredeck, and there were four torpedoes slung in launching cradles. The hardware didn't make half as much impression on me as the ranks of helmeted men drawn up on deck. I sat and watched. The men shuffled off onto the pier, formed up into two squads. I counted. Forty-eight men and a couple of officers. There was the faint sound of orders being barked, and the column stepped off, moving along the paved row that swung between the transplanted royal palms and hibiscus, right up to the wide drive that curved off to the house. They halted, did a left face, and stood at parade rest. The two officers, wearing Class A's, and a tubby civilian with a briefcase came up the drive, trying to look as casual as possible under the circumstances. They paused at the foot of the broad flight of Tennessee marble steps leading up to my porch. The leading officer, a brigadier general no less, looked up at me. "'May we come up, sir?' he said. I looked across at the silent ranks waiting at the foot of the drive. "'If the boys want a drink of water, Sarge,' I said, "'tell them to come on over.' "'I am General Smale,' the B.G. said. "'This is Colonel Sanchez of the Peruvian Army.' He indicated the other military type. And Mr. Pruffy of the American Embassy at Lima. Howdy, Mr. Pruffy, I said. Howdy, Mr. Sanchez. Howdy. This, uh, call is official in nature, Mr. Legion, the general said. It's a matter of great importance, involving the security of your country. Okay, general, I said. Come on up. What's happened? You boys haven't started another war, have you? They filed up onto the terrace hesitated, then shook hands, and sat down gingerly in the chairs. Pruffy held his briefcase in his lap. "'Put your sandwiches on the table, if you like, Mr. Pruffy,' I said. He blinked, gripped the briefcase tighter. I offered my hand-tooled cigars around. Pruffy looked startled. Smale shook his head, and Sanchez took three. "'I'm here,' the general said, "'to ask you a few questions, Mr. Legion.' Mr. Pruffy represents the Department of State in the matter, and Colonel Sanchez... Don't tell me, I said. He represents the Peruvian government, which is why I don't ask you what an armed American force is doing wandering around on Peruvian soil. Here, Pruffy put in. I hardly think... I believe you, I said. What's it all about, Smale? I'll come directly to the point, he said. For some time, the investigative and security agencies of the U.S. government have been building a file on what, for lack of a better name, has been called the Martians. Smale coughed apologetically. <clears throat> a little over three years ago, he went on, an unidentified flying object. You interested in flying saucers, General? By no means, he snapped. The object appeared on a number of radar screens, descending from extreme altitude. It came to Earth at... Don't tell me you came all the way out here to tell me you can't tell me, I said. A sight in England, Smale said. American aircraft were dispatched to investigate the object. Before they could make identification, it rose again, accelerated at tremendous speed, and was lost at an altitude of several hundred miles. I thought we had better radar than that, I said. The satellite program... No such specialized equipment was available. Smale said. An intensive investigation turned up the fact that two strangers, possibly Americans, had visited the site only a few hours before the, uh, visitation. I nodded. I was thinking about the close call I'd had when I went back to see about lobbing a bomb down the shaft to obliterate the beacon station. There were plainclothes men all over the place, like old maids at a movie star's funeral. It was just as well. They never found it. The rocket blasts had collapsed the tunnel, and apparently the whole underground installation was made of non-metallic substances that didn't show up in detecting equipment. I had an idea metal was passé where Foster came from. Some months later, Smale went on, 
a series of rather curious short films went on exhibition in the United States. They showed scenes representing conditions on other planets, as well as ancient and prehistoric incidents here on Earth. They were prefaced with explanations that they merely represented the opinions of science as to what was likely to be found on distant worlds. They attracted wide interest, and with few exceptions scientists praised their verisimilitude. I admire a clever fake, I said, with a topical subject like space travel, one item which was commented on as a surprising inaccuracy, in view of the technical excellence of the other films, Smale said, was the view of our planet from space showing the Earth against the backdrop of stars. A study of the constellations by astronomers quickly indicated a date approximately 7,000 B.C. for the scene. Oddly, the north polar cap was shown centered on Hudson's Bay. No south polar cap was in evidence. The continent of Antarctica appeared to be at a latitude of some thirty degrees, entirely free of ice. I looked at him and waited. Now, studies made since that time indicate that nine thousand years ago the North Pole was indeed centered on Hudson's Bay, Smale said, and Antarctica was in fact ice-free. That idea has been around a long time, I said. There was a theory. Then there was the matter of the views of Mars. The general went on. The aerial shots of the canals were regarded as very cleverly done. He turned to Pruffy, who opened his briefcase and handed a couple of photos across. This is a scene taken from the film, Smale said. It was an eight by ten color shot showing a row of mounds drifted with pinkish dust against a blue black horizon. Smale placed another photo beside the first. This one, he said, was taken by automatic cameras in the successful Mars probe of last year. I looked. The second shot was fuzzy, and the color was shifted badly toward the blue, but there was no mistaking the scene. The mounds were drifted a little deeper, and the angle was different, but they were the same mounds. In the meantime, Smale bored on relentlessly, a number of novel products appeared on the market. Chemists and physicists alike were dumbfounded at the theoretical base implied by the techniques involved. One of the products, a type of pigment, embodied a completely new concept of crystallography. Progress, I said. Why, when I was a boy, it was an extremely torturous trail we followed, Smale said. But we found that all these curious observations making up the Martian's file had, in the end, only one factor in common. And that factor, Mr. Legion, was you. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was a few minutes after sunrise, and Smale and I were back on the terrace, toying with the remains of ham steaks and honeydew. That's one advantage of being in jail in your own house. The food's good, I commented. I can understand your feelings, Smale said. Frankly, I didn't relish this assignment, but it's clear that there are matters here which require explanation. It was my hope that you'd see fit to cooperate voluntarily. Take your army and sail off into the sunrise, General, I said. Then maybe I'll be in a position to do something voluntary. Your patriotism alone... My patriotism keeps telling me that, where I come from, a citizen has certain legal rights, I said. This is a matter that transcends legal technicalities, Smale said. I'll tell you quite frankly. The presence of the task force here only received ex post facto approval by the Peruvian government. They were faced with the fate accompli. I mention this only to indicate just how strongly the government feels in this matter. Seeing you hit the beach with a platoon of infantry was enough of a hint for me, I said. You're lucky I didn't wipe you out with my disintegrator rays. Smell choked on a bite of melon. Just kidding, I said. But I haven't given you any trouble. Why the reinforcements? Smale stared at me. What reinforcements? 
I pointed with a fork. He turned, gazed out to sea. A conning tower was breaking the surface, leaving a white wake behind. It rose higher, water streaming off the deck. A hatch popped open, and men poured out, lining up. Smale got to his feet, his napkin falling to the floor. Sergeant! he yelled. I sat open-mouthed as Smale jumped to the stair, went down it three steps at a time. I heard him bellowing, the shouts of men and the clatter of rifles being unstacked, feet pounding. I went to the marble banister and looked down. Pruffy was out on the lawn in purple pajamas, yelping questions. Colonel Sanchez was pulling at Smale's arm, also yelling. The Marines were forming up on the lawn. "'Let's watch those petunias, Sergeant,' I yelled. "'Keep out of this, Legion,' Smale shouted. "'Why should I be the only one not yelling?' I yelled. "'After all, I own the place.' Smale bounded back up the stairs. "'You're my prime responsibility, Legion,' he barked. "'I'm getting you to a point of maximum security. "'Where's the cellar?' "'I keep it downstairs,' I said. "'What's this all about? Inter-service rivalry? You afraid the sailors are going to steal the glory?' "'That's a nuclear-powered sub,' Smale barked. "'Gagarin class. It belongs to the Soviet Navy.' I stood there with my mouth open, looking at Smale without seeing him, and trying hard to think fast. I hadn't been too startled when the Marines showed up. I had gone over the legal aspects of my situation months before with a platoon of high-priced legal talent. I knew that sooner or later somebody would come around to hit me for tax evasion, draft dodging, or overtime parking. But I was in the clear. The government might resent my knowing a lot of things it didn't, but no one could ever prove I'd swiped them from Uncle Sam. In the end, they'd have to let me go, and my account in a Swiss bank would last me even if they managed to suppress any new development from my fabulous lab. In a way, I was glad the showdown had come. But I'd forgotten about the Russians. Naturally, they'd be interested, and their spies were at least as good as the intrepid agents of the U.S. Secret Service. I should have realized that, sooner or later, they'd pay a call. And the legal niceties wouldn't slow them down. They'd slap me into a brain laundry and sweat every last secret out of me as casually as I'd squeeze a lemon. The sub was fully surfaced now, and I was looking down the barrels of half a dozen five-inch rifles, any one of which could blast Smale's navy out of the water with one salvo. There were a couple of hundred men, I estimated, putting landing boats over the side and spilling into them. Down on the lawn, the sergeant was snapping orders, and the men were double-timing off to positions that must have been spotted in advance. It looked like the Russians weren't entirely unexpected. This was a game the big boys were playing, and I was just a pawn caught in the middle. My rosy picture of me confounding the bureaucrats was fading fast. My island was about to become a battlefield, and whichever way it turned out, I'd be the loser. I had one slim possibility, to get lost in the shuffle. Smale grabbed my arm. Don't stand there, man, he snapped. Which way? Sorry, General, I said, and slammed a hard right to his stomach. He folded, but still managed to lunge for me. I gave him a left to the jaw, and he dropped. I jumped over him, plunged through the French doors, and took the spiral glass stairway four at a time, whirled and slammed the strong-room door behind me. The armored walls would stand anything short of a direct hit with a good-sized artillery shell, and the boys down below were unlikely to use any heavy stuff for fear of damaging the goods they'd been sent out to collect. I was safe for a little while. Now I had to do some fast, accurate thinking. I couldn't carry much with me when and if I made it off the island. A few briefing rods, maybe what was left of the movies. But I had already audited most of the rods. I knew them as well as I know my tax bracket. One listen to a rod gave you a fast picture of the subject. Two or three repeats engraved it on your brain. The only reason a man couldn't know everything was that too much, too fast, would overload the mind, 
and Amnesia wiped the slate clean. I didn't have time to use any more rods, and I couldn't carry anything, but just to walk off and leave it all? I rummaged through odds and ends, stuffing small items into my pockets. I came across a dull silvery cylinder, three inches long, striped in black and gold, a memory trace. It reminded me of something. That was an idea. I still had the U-shaped plastic headpiece that Foster had used to acquire a background knowledge of his old home. I had tried it once for a moment. It had given me a headache in two seconds flat, just pressed against my temple. It had been lying here ever since. But maybe now is the time to try it again. Half the items I had here in my strong room were mysteries, like the silver cylinder in my hand but I knew exactly what the plastic headband could give me. It contained all anyone needed to know about Valen and the two worlds, and all the marvels they possessed. I glanced out the armor-glass window. Smale's marines were trotting across the lawn. The Russians were fanning out along the water's edge. It looked like business, all right. Still, it would take them a while to get warmed up and more time still to decide to blast me out of my fort. It had taken an hour or so for Foster to soak up the briefing. Maybe I wouldn't be much longer at it. I tossed the cylinder aside, tried a couple of drawers, found the inconspicuous strip of plastic that encompassed a whole civilization. I carried it across to a chair, settled myself, then hesitated. This thing had been designed for an alien brain, not mine. Suppose it burnt out my wiring, left me here gibbering for Smale or the Ruskies to work over. But the alternative was to leave my island virtually empty-handed, settle for what I might in time manage to salvage from my account, if I could devise a way of withdrawing money without calling down the Gestapo. No, I wouldn't go back to poverty without a struggle. What I could carry in my head would give me independence, even immunity, from the greed of nations. I could barter my knowledge for my freedom. There were plenty of things wrong with this picture, but it was the best I could do on short notice. Gingerly, I fitted the U-shaped band to my head. There was a feeling of pressure, then a sensation like warm water rising about me. Panic tried to rise, faded. A voice seemed to reassure me. I was among friends. I was safe. All was well. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of A Trace of Memory » by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I lay in the dark, the memory of towers and trumpets and fountains of fire in my mind. I put up my hand, felt a coarse garment. Had I but dreamed? I stirred. Light blazed in a widening band above my face. Through narrowed eyes I saw a room, a mean chamber, dusty, littered with ill-sorted rubbish. In a wall there was a window. I went to it, stared out upon a green sward, a path that curved downward to a white strand. It was a strange scene, and yet a wave of vertigo swept over me, faded. I blinked, tried to remember. I reached up, felt something clamped over my head. I pulled it off, and it fell to the floor with a faint clatter. A broad-spectrum briefing device of the type used to indoctrinate unidentified citizens who had undergone a change unprepared. Suddenly, like water pouring down a drain, the picture in my mind faded left me standing in my old familiar junk room with a humming in my head and a throb in my temples. I had been about to try the briefing gimmick and had wondered if it would work. It had, with a vengeance. For a minute there I had stumbled around the room like a stranger yearning for dear old Valen. I could remember the feeling, but it was gone now. It was just me, in trouble as usual. There were a lot of tantalizing ideas floating around in my mind right at the edge of consciousness. Later, I'd have to sit down and go over them carefully. Right now, I had my hands full. Two armies had me cornered, and all the guns belonged to the opposition. 
That part was okay. I didn't want to fight anybody. All I wanted out of the situation was me. A rattle of gunfire outside brought me to the window in a jump. It was the same view as a few moments before, but it made more sense now. There was the still smoking wreckage of the PT boat, sunk in ten feet of water a few yards from the end of the jetty. Somebody must have tried to make a run for it. The Russian sub was nowhere in sight. Probably it had landed the men and backed out of danger from any unexpected quarter. Two or three corpses lay in view, down by the water's edge. From where I stood I couldn't say whether they were good guys or villains. There were more shots, coming from somewhere off to the left. It looked like the boys were fighting it out old style, hand to hand, with small arms. It figured. After all, what they wanted was me and all my clever ideas intact, not a smoking ruin. I don't know whether it was my romantic streak or my cynical one that had made me drive the architect nuts putting secret passages in the walls of my chateau and tunnels under the lawn, but I was glad now I had them. There was a narrow door in the west wall of the strong room that gave onto a tight spiral stair. From there I could take my choice, the boathouse, the edge of the woods behind the house, or the beach a hundred yards north of the jetty. All I had to do was... The house trembled a split second ahead of a terrific blast that slammed me to the floor. I felt blood start from my nose. Head ringing, I scrambled to my feet, groped through the dust to my escape hatch. Somebody outside was getting impatient. It wouldn't do to have my fancy getaway route fall in before I had used it. I felt another shell hit the house. Mortars, I guess, or rockets. I must have slept through the preliminaries and wakened just in time for the main bout. My fingers were on the sensitive pressure areas that worked the concealed door. I took a last glance around the room, where the dust was just settling from the last blast. My eyes fell on a plain pewter-colored cylinder lying where I had tossed it an hour before. But now I knew what it was. In one jump I was across the room and had grabbed it up. I remembered finding it aboard the lifeboat when I tidied up. It had lain concealed among the bones of the man with the bare tooth necklace. He must have come across it, admired its pretty colors, and tucked it away in his fur pants. And now I, with my Valonian memories banked in my mind, could appreciate just how precious an object it was. It was Foster's memory. It would only be a copy, undoubtedly. Still, I couldn't leave it behind. A blast heavier than the last one rocked the house. A big chunk of plaster fell. It was way past time to go. Snorting and coughing from the dust, I got back to the emergency door, went through it, and started down. At the bottom I paused to think it over, and the earth jumped again. I fell back, saw the roof of the beach tunnel collapse. That left the woods and the boathouse. I didn't have much time to decide. The tunnels might go any second. Apparently my architect had economized on the tunnel shorings. But then he hadn't figured on any major wars happening in the front yard. The fight was going on, as near as I could judge, to the south of the house and behind it. Probably the woods were full of skirmishers, taking advantage of the cover. The best bet was the boathouse, direct. I'd have preferred to wait until dark, but the idea didn't seem practical under the circumstances. I took a deep breath and started into the tunnel. With a little luck I'd find my boat intact. I would have to pull out under the noses of the combatants but maybe the element of surprise would give me a few hundred yards start. I had enough horses to beat anything afloat to the mainland, if I could make a clean break. The tunnel was dark, but that didn't bother me. It ran dead straight to the boathouse. I came to the wooden slat door and stood for a moment, listening. Everything was quiet. I eased it open and stepped onto the ramp inside the building. In the gloom, polished mahogany and chrome work threw back muted highlights. I circled, slipped the mooring rope, and was about to step into the cockpit when I heard the bolt of a rifle smack home. I whirled, threw myself flat. The deafening BAM of a thirty caliber fired at close quarters laid a pattern of fine ripples on the black water. 
I rolled, hit with a splash that drowned a second shot, and dove deep. Three strokes took me under the door, out into the green gloom of open water. I hugged the yellowish sand of the bottom, angled off to the right, and kept going. I had to get out of my jacket, but somehow I managed it, almost without losing a stroke. And there went all the goodies I'd stashed away in the pockets down to the bottom of the drink. I still had Foster's memory trace. It was in my slacks, and there wasn't time to get out of them, nor to kick off my tennis shoes. Ten strokes. Fifteen. Twenty. I knew my limit. Twenty-five good strokes on a full load of air. But I had dived in a hurry. Twenty-five. And another. And one more. And, up above, a man was waiting, rifle aimed, for my head to break the surface. Thirty strokes, and here I come, ready or not. I rolled on my back, got my face above the surface. I got half a gulp of fresh air before the shot slapped spray into my face and echoed off across the water. I sank like a stone, kicked off, and made another twenty-five yards before I had to come up. The rifleman was faster this time. The bullet crossed my shoulder like a hot iron, and I was under water again. My kick work was weak now. The strength was draining from my arms fast. I had to have air, but I could almost feel the solid smack of a steel-jacketed bullet against my skull. I had to keep going. My chest was on fire, and there was a whirling blackness all around me. I felt consciousness fading, but maybe just one more stroke. As from a distance, I observed the clumsy efforts of the swimmer, watched the flounderings of the poor untrained creature. It was apparent that an override of the autonomic system was required. With dispatch, I activated cortical area Omicron, rerouted the blood supply, drew an emergency oxygen source from stored fats, diverting the necessary energy to break the molecular bonds. Now, with the body drawing on internal sources, ample for six hundred seconds at maximum demand, I stimulated areas Upsilon and Mu. I channeled full survival-level energy to the muscle complexes involved, increased power output to full skeletal tolerance, eliminated waste motion. The body drove through the water with the fluid grace of a sea denizen. I floated on my back, breathing in great surges of cool air and blinking at the crimson sky. I had been under water, a few yards from shore, drowning. Then there was an awareness, like a voice, telling me what to do. From out of the mass of Valonian knowledge I had acquired, I had drawn what I needed. And now I was here, half a mile from the beach, winded but intact. And there was no time now to wonder at miracles. I raised my head and glanced toward the house. A column of smoke rose from a gaping cavity where the bedroom windows used to be. A man jumped up, darted across the lawn, fell. I heard a shot a few seconds later, floating lazily across the still sunset water. There was no visible activity at the water's edge. The rifleman was gone. He probably thought he'd finished me, especially if he had noticed blood in the water. I thought about sharks. I hadn't heard of any in this neighborhood, but a little blood was just a thing to bait them in. I twisted, got a look at the throbbing burn across my left shoulder where the rifleman's bullet had grazed. It was nothing much, just a skin gouge. It didn't seem to be bleeding. If it had been, there wasn't much I could do about it. It was no time for worrying. I had to keep my mind on the problem of getting to the mainland. It was a fifteen-mile swim, but if the boys on shore could keep each other occupied, I ought to be able to make it. I thought again about pulling off my pants and shoes, but decided against it. I'd be in awkward shape without them if I made it. I felt beat as though I hadn't eaten all day, which wasn't too strange, because I hadn't. Well, at least I wouldn't get stomach cramps when circling the island. From there I'd strike out for sure, and the first thing I would do when I got out of this would be to order the biggest, rarest steak in South America. 
I took a last look toward the house. I could see fire inside it now. I guessed each side was rationalizing the destruction as denial to the enemy. It had been a nice place, and I'd miss it. Some day, somebody was going to pay for it. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I sat at the kitchen table in Margareta's Lima apartment and gnawed the last few shreds of the stripped T-bone while my girl poured me another cup of coffee. "'Now tell me about it,' she said. "'Why did they burn your house? And how did you succeed in getting here?' They got so interested in the fight they lost their heads, I said. That's the only explanation I can think of. I thought I'd be as safe as a two-dollar watch at a pickpockets convention. I figured they'd go to some pains to avoid damaging me. I guessed wrong. But your own people! Maybe they were right. They couldn't afford to let the Ruskies get me. Funny. If they just thought to write me a letter and ask for my cooperation. But how did you get covered with mud and the blood stains on your back? I had a nice long swim, five hours worth, then another hour getting through a mangrove swamp. Lucky I had a moon, then a three hour hike, and here I am. I hope you are feeling better now that you've had something to eat. You look terrible. Another block and I wouldn't have made it. I felt sucked dry. The scratch on my back is nothing. But maybe the shock. I don't know. Lie down now and sleep, said Margareta. What do you want me to do? Get me some clothes, I said. A gray suit, white shirt, black tie and shoes. And go to the bank and draw some money. Say, five thousand. Oh, yeah. See if there's anything in the papers. If you see anybody hanging around the lobby when you come back, don't come up. Give me a call, and I'll meet you. She stood up. This is really awful, she said. Can't your embassy... Didn't I mention it? A Mr. Pruffy of the embassy came along to hold Smale's hand. Not to mention a Colonel Sanchez. I wouldn't be surprised if the local cops weren't in the act by now. Unless they all think I'm dead. That impression won't last long after you show up with a nice fresh check on my account and spend part of it on a man's suit. I'll get some sleep and light out as soon as you get back. Where will you go? I'll get to the airport and play it by ear. I don't think they've alerted everybody. It was a hush-hush deal until it went sour. Now they're still picking up the pieces. The bank won't be open for hours yet said Margareta. Go to sleep and don't worry. I'll take care of everything. I made it to the bedroom and slid out on the big wide bed, and consciousness slipped away like a silk curtain falling. I knew I wasn't alone as soon as I opened my eyes. I hadn't heard anything, but I could feel someone in the room. I sat up slowly, looked around. He was sitting in the embroidered chair by the window, an ordinary-looking fellow in a tan tropical suit, with an unlighted cigarette in his mouth and no particular expression on his face. "'Go ahead. Light up,' I said. "'Don't mind me.' "'Thanks,' he said in a thin voice. He took a lighter from an inner pocket, flipped it, held it to the cigarette. I stood up. There was a blur of motion from my visitor and the lighter was gone, and a short-nosed revolver was in its place. "'You've got the wrong scoop, mister,' I said. "'I don't bite.' "'I'd rather you wouldn't move suddenly, Mr. Legion,' he said. He coughed, his eyes on mine. "'My nerves aren't what they used to be.' The gun was still on me. "'Which side are you working for?' I said. "'And can I put my shoes on, or are you afraid I'll pull a gat out of my sock? He rested the pistol on his knee. "'Get completely dressed, Mr. Legion.' "'Sorry,' I said. "'No can do. No clothes.' 
He frowned slightly. My jacket will be a little small for you, he said, but I think you can manage. I was sitting on the bed again. I'm going to get out a cigarette, I said. Try not to shoot me. I reached for a package on the table, lit up. His eyes stayed on mine. How come you didn't figure I was dead? I asked, blowing smoke at him. We checked the house, he said. No body. Why, you incompetent asses. You were supposed to think I drowned. That possibility was considered, but we made the routine checks anyway. Nice of you to let me sleep it out. How long have you been here? Only a few minutes, he said. He glanced at his watch. We'll have to be going in another fifteen. What do you want with me, I said. You blew up everything you were interested in. The department wants to ask you a few questions. Look, I'm just a dumb guy, I whined. I don't know nothing about all that stuff. I was just the guy that peddled it, see? He took a drag on his cigarette, squinted at me through the smoke. You ran up an A average in college, he said, including English. You boys really do your homework. I looked at the pistol. I wonder if you'd really shoot me. I mused. I'll try to make the position clear, he said, just to avoid any unfortunate misunderstanding. My instructions are to bring you in alive, if possible. If it appears that you may evade arrest or fall into the wrong hands, I'll be forced to use the gun. I pulled my shoes on, thinking it over. My best chance to make a break was now, while there was only one watchdog but I had a feeling he was telling the truth about shooting me. I had already seen the boys in action at the house. He got up. Let's step into the living room, Mr. Legion. I moved past him through the door. In the living room, the clock on the mantel said eleven. I'd been asleep for five or six hours. Margareta ought to be getting back any minute. Put this on, he said. I took the light jacket, wedged myself into it, looked at my reflection in the big rectangular mirror that occupied most of the wall above the low divan. "'It's not the real me,' I said. "'I usually—' The telephone rang. I looked at my watchdog. He shook his head. We stood and listened to it ring. After a while, it stopped. "'We'd better be going now,' he said. "'Walk ahead of me, please. We'll take the elevator to the basement and leave by the service entrance.' He stopped talking, eyes on the door. There was the rattle of a key. The gun came up. Hold it, I snapped. It's the girl who owns the apartment. I moved to face him, my back to the door. That was foolish of you, Legion, he said. Don't move again. I watched the door in the big mirror on the opposite wall. The knob turned, the door swung in, and a thin brown man in white shirt and white pants slipped into the room. As he pushed the door back, he transferred a small automatic to his left hand. My keeper threw a lever on the revolver that was aimed at my belt buckle. Stand absolutely still, Legion, he said. If you have a chance, that's it. He moved aside slightly, looked past me to the newcomer. I watched in the mirror as the man in white behind me swiveled to keep both of us covered. This is a fail-safe weapon, said my first owner to the new man. I think you know about them. We leaked the information to you. I'm holding the trigger back. If my hand relaxes, it fires. So I'd be a little careful about shooting if I were you. The thin man swallowed, a black leather bow tie bobbing against his Adam's apple. He didn't say anything. He was having to make some tough decisions. His instructions would be the same as my other friends, to bring me in alive, if possible. Who does this bird represent? I asked my man. I noticed my voice was pitched half an octave higher than usual. He's a Soviet agent. I looked in the mirror at the man again. Nuts, I said. He looks like a waiter in a chili joint. He probably came up to take our order. You talk too much when you're nervous, said my keeper between his teeth. He held the gun on me steadily. I watched his trigger finger to see if it looked like relaxing. I'd say it's a stalemate, I said. 
Let's take it once more from the top. Both of you go out and... Shut up, Legion. My man licked his lips, glanced at my face. I'm sorry. It looks as though... You don't want to shoot me, I blurted out loudly. In the mirror I had seen the door, which was standing ajar, ease open an inch, two inches. You'll spoil this nice coat. I kept on talking. And anyway, it would be a big mistake, because everybody knows Russian agents are stubby men with wide cheekbones and tight hats. Silently, Margareta slipped into the room, took two quick steps, and slammed a heavy handbag down on the slicked-back pompadour that went with the Adam's apple. The man in white stumbled and fired around into the rug. The automatic dropped from his hand, and my pal in tan stepped to him and hit him hard on the back of the head with his pistol. He whirled toward me, hissed, Play it smart, just loud enough for me to hear, then turned to Margareta. He slipped the gun into his pocket, but I knew he could get it out again in a hurry. Very nicely done, miss, he said. I'll have this person removed from your apartment. Mr. Legion and I were just going. Margareta looked at me. I thought over two or three remarks, but none of them seemed to fit. I didn't intend to see her get hurt, or involved. Apparently my FBI type was willing to leave her out of it, if I went quietly. On the other hand, this was my last chance to get out of the net before it closed for good. My keeper was watching, waiting for me to try something, tip Margareta off. It's okay, honey, I said. This is Mr. Smith, of our embassy. We're old friends. I stepped past her, headed for the door. My hand was on the knob when I heard a solid thunk behind me. I whirled in time to clip the FBI on the jaw as he fell forward. Margareta looked at me wide-eyed. That handbag packs a wallop, I said. Nice work, Maggie. I knelt, pulled off the fellow's belt, and cinched his hands behind his back with it. Margareta got the idea, did the same for the other man, who was beginning to groan now. Who are these men? she said. What? I'll tell you all about it later. Right now, I have to get to some people I know, get the story on the wires, out in the open. State'll be a little shy about gunning me down or locking me up without trial if I give the show enough publicity. I reached in my pocket, handed her the black and gold marked cylinder. Just to be on the safe side, I said, mail this to me. John Jones at Idzenka, General Delivery. All right, said Margareta, and I have your things. She stepped into the hall, came back with a shopping bag and a suit carton. She took a wad of bills from her handbag and handed it to me. I went to her and put my arms around her. Listen, honey, as soon as I leave, go to the bank and draw fifty grand. Get out of the country. They haven't got anything on you except that you beamed a couple of intruders in your apartment. But it'd be better if you disappear. Leave an address, care of Poste Restante, Basel, Switzerland. I'll get in touch when I can. She put up an argument but I made my point. Twenty minutes later, I was pushing through the big glass doors onto the sidewalk, clean-shaven, dressed to the teeth, with five grand on one hip and a thirty-two on the other. I'd had a good meal and a fair sleep, and against me the secret services of two or three countries didn't have a chance. I got as far as the coroner before they nailed me. End of chapter 11